Thank you for joining us for another edition of Mental Health Mondays. I am Mind Runner, aka AA Ron, aka Nephew Aaron, to some people, especially my guest at this time. My coolest, one of my coolest, because I, I, I got to be cool to the other aunts I have. But Auntie M herself, my Aunt Margo, is joining me for Mental Health Mondays. Auntie M, how are you? I am doing great. It's supposed to be raining right now, and it's not. It's nice and sunny out, so I'm in really good sense of mental health, actually. Excellent, excellent. It's it's interesting how the weather can really influence mental health, and you know, it's like not just air pressure and whatnot, but just like when the sun is shining, it's nice. It's pretty cool out there, unless there's people out there, and then you don't want to see people, and it's that can that can ruin. You well, might. you know, <laughs> it is amazing that there are days when I like it to rain because that gives me the excuse just to kind of curl up and read a book or catch up on my emails or whatever, too. So, yeah, there's there's days for both. But, you know, the sun definitely makes you feel less sad. Yeah, for sure. And, but so there's nothing like when it's a cold, rainy day and you just curl up, you could just pop on Netflix or take a nap or just you know, curl up with a book. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yep, absolutely. Well I, well, I appreciate you joining me today because we've got, uh, and I don't know how much of this might be me sorting out my mental health stuff and, and you know, just memory lane from a lot of things that, um, that you had experience with me. But um, I, I uh, it's interesting. We're living in an interesting time now. And I feel like there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of social media is kind of affecting a lot of folks mentally and, you know, not just with, um, you know, with politics, but also just in general with mental health. And sometimes it's better just to push it all away. Have you, have you been, um, have you noticed that like, like anything, cha- like anything different in society compared to where it used to be with the growth of mental of uh, social media? Yeah, you know, of course, back in the day, you know, you had mentioned earlier when we were like um, talking briefly um, about raising the kids, like just for people that don't know me, you know, I have two kids. Um, One's just a little younger than you and the other one's a little bit more younger than you. Mm -hmm. Um, Back in those days, we didn't have social media. And I think raising them was difficult um but it was nowhere near as difficult as it is now um Mm -hmm. what i find now for me as a woman of a certain age i'm 35 right right i'm borrowing (laughs) that quote from uh one of my favorite authors um they i have a hard time grasping certain social media you know and and um, so I follow Facebook, but I'm careful what I follow on Facebook. Um, I have, I also follow Instagram just because I want to see the pictures and that's it. I mean, I don't understand any of the other stuff. <laughs> and quite honestly, I'm kind of afraid to follow any of the other stuff because um, I just, don't know it and I don't know if I want to know it. <laughs> You're not even sure you want to put your toe in the water there. Right. Well, it's right. a whole like any any of these social media platforms, it's a whole world. You know, like just you know, I just I've just recently been getting more involved with Instagram and I've been gone from Facebook for a while. I just recently in the last few months been coming back. But it's a lot. It's there's a lot in I think it, it's always funny when you, you know, when, when kids, like even when I, when I was teaching, you know, for like a fourth grader would say something and I'd have to quickly look up what that is, you know, like sus was something I had to realize, Oh, that's in reference to a video game called among us. But they, they would, they would say that's sus. You know, that's like the slang term, but it's like having to keep up with everything. You were so brave. <laughs> to be teaching that age level on uh, my hat was off to you my goodness you know um 
you know, Nicole has Abigail, my mm -hmm. granddaughter, who is um, six, and she keeps me hopping at six. <laughs> I, you know, she told me the other day that uh, one was a prime number, and she's in kindergarten, six years old, and she told me one was a prime number, and it was like, <laughs> You know, what? I don't. Re yeah, I don't yeah. remember being one years old and knowing that. Yeah, um, in kindergarten, you were lucky if you remembered purple. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. I can name six colors in the crown box. Yay me! <laughs> and I didn't eat the paste. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You know, and, and so it's times have changed so much, and what's expected of the kids these days. Um, I don't, I'll be honest with you, Aaron. I don't know if it's good or bad and I mm -hmm. don't know if it's normal. Yeah. And, and you know, I don't know if normal is the right word. Well, it's hard to find where the balance should be. Like it's one side to push, push kids to, you know, to try to be the best they can be. But there's also that you don't want to sacrifice them being a kid, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you want them out um, playing and having a good time. But, you know, parents over the years, when I was little, of course, um, you got up on Saturday morning I'm regular school week, you get up on a Saturday morning, you have breakfast and you go out the back door and your parents wouldn't see you again until maybe lunchtime, but definitely dinner. Yeah. You know, and you went in and when the lights came on. Um, but when I raised Chris and, and Cole, um, I was a little bit more protective. They could go out and play with the kids in the neighborhood, but we always knew where they were. Yeah. Nowadays, um, it seems like the kids go out and they have play dates. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and the kids don't just go out and play in the neighborhood. You can't because you can't trust what's going on in society that they're not going to be picked up. Like, for instance, I took Abigail to the park um, Saturday. And I had to have my, I felt like I had to have my eyes on her the entire time, mm -hmm. which when I was little, my parents could have cared less where I was in yeah. the park. Yeah. You could go to the park by yourself, like just ride your bike down to the park. Right. Yeah. And you know, that says so much about the way things are and, and it's too bad, mm -hmm. you know, um, I wish it could be different. Do you do you think how much of this do you think is changing of the times, or are we more aware of these kind of things happening? Like, so we're we're more protective, or is it more, or is is it kind of column A, column B? Are we, are is there more of a of the of a risk in abductions or things happening? today than there used to be or is it just nowadays we're more aware of those kind of things yes <laughs> great um, answer great answer <laughs> i think i think there's a combination of everything you know we have more population than we did back when i was little true um when i was little of course we were taught in school that you never accepted a a candy bar from somebody you didn't know yeah um so there was the awareness because those things did happen. Mm -hmm. um, I remember trick or treating, you know, you were always told um, to check your candy before you ate it, that kind of thing. Um, I think media pit plays a, a lot into it as well. Um, I mean, there, Media has good and bad in the fact that um, it lets us know mm -hmm. when things are going bad and we need to be aware if something's going on. 
But on the other side, that also plays to people that want their 15 minutes of fame or their 10 minutes of fame. Yeah. And sadly, I don't have an answer for that. You know, um, and hey, so... You think, you think about like the rec the, the shootings, you know, the recently and, and how much, you know, when you spend a lot of time not really glorifying, but giving a lot of headlines to the assailant, to the, the suspect, and not as equal time to the people that, that, that died. It's, it almost creates that, it almost creates that, Hey, you know, that, that glorification of it, where someone else is like, well, someone else in a very, very bad state of mind, like, Hey, I'm going to make headlines. You know, my life is terrible. I, I don't see a way out. So at least I'm going to go out with the head, with a headline. Right. Right. You know, and, um, you know, I had this discussion with your father. I don't know if it's okay for me to say that on, sure. on this, but, um, you know, back in the seventies, um, they used to have mental health facilities mm -hmm. and during the seventies, they started shutting those down. Um, and understandably so, because they, uh, most of them were very cruel and they treated the, the patients they had there. Um, They're less than human. Exactly. Yeah. But I'm beginning to think that maybe and I hesitate to say this because mm -hmm. it's kind of a new thought for me mm -hmm. that maybe creating um, facilities that are more like um, facilities for like rehab or something. Well, for, or rehab or elderly, even, you know. Oh, I, senior living, yeah. Like senior living, mm -hmm. where um, they could go and they could live and still be monitored and made sure that they stay on their meds. and. Just don't put the Cuomos in charge of it, though. That, that would be... But, yeah. <laughs> no, but you, I think you're right, and it's one of those babies in the baby in the bathwater type things. It's you know those facilities, like the the problem wasn't that the facilities existed; the problem was the way they were run. If you right. had a much more like patient focused kind of facility that you could have, and you know, let's let let's be honest. You know, there's there's money to be made in prescription drugs. You know, if you can and if you can treat a mental a mental illness with a with a with a pill rather than sending somebody to a facility and and having a like a facility that's going to cost a lot of money and and upkeep. Yeah, you know, that that might be the the way that some folks might go. Well, you know. You know, quite honestly, I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a classic case that I suffer from depression. I have all my life. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger than you, um, I kept thinking it was a, an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. It was something to be ashamed of. And I had a really good psychopharmaceutical nurse that treated me for a while. And she explained to me, you know, the brain is an organ, just like anything else in your, your body. Mm -hmm. And you probably, and as it turns out from experience, your brain doesn't quite work right. And, you know, well, you, you don't have to tell me that. I know. <laughs> But the, see, the, th the thing with me is, you know, I, I have a depressive disorder. Mm -hmm. And when she explained that and they found the right medication for me to take, it levels out the depression. And, and yeah. it makes it makes this, uh, I'm not sure I got the right term, but the synapses fire correctly and it keeps me level. And, you know, I tried over the years when I was younger in my forties and stuff to lower it and, and, um, come off it or lower it and stuff. And I finally found that level that is good for me. 
-hmm. And um, just recently, my um, neurologist that I was seeing for my migraines tried to get me to come off one of the meds I was on because um, he didn't think I needed it for the migraine. Mm -hmm. And when I came off of it, it was like I went into this horrible, horrible state where I just didn't like being with myself. Mm. And that's, yeah. as, that's as recent as, you know, I think it was about a year ago. And I called him up and I said, I can't do this. And he said, well, go back on it. And it, you know, it only took a couple of days, but those were horrible days. Yeah. You know, and people, unfortunately, people don't like to believe that their brain can um, control them like that. Yeah. Because, you know, you like to feel like you're in control, <laughs> but you don't realize that your brain really does a lot of control. Yeah, there's a lot more going up here that's right. not, you know, that's not in control. And it's, you'll, it's, it's the funny thing, too, that, like, with my GERD medicine, and this is the typical me is that I'll, I'll get going along and I'm like, I'm feeling fine. I don't need to take it anymore. And so I'll stop taking it. And then suddenly I'm like, Oh, like this, you know, and it's the same yeah. with, with, with any kind of meds. It's like you, you dummy, you, listen, you dingus. It's because it's doing its job. That's why you need to keep taking it. Right. And, and, and I, and I, I really don't want to deter anybody from seeking uh, pharmaceutical assistance you you got to find the right person and whatnot i know that lately with a lot a lot of the pfizer stuff some folks are more apprehensive to get into pharmaceuticals but what works most i'd say a majority of prescription drugs are designed for exactly that what you described that balance that you know making sure that like right evening the boat if for lack yeah. of a better analogy you know, and it's frustrating trying for many, many, many people um, finding that level, um, especially as you're a growing adolescent teenager mm. and someone in their 20s, because your brain's really not solidified until your 20s, um, trying to find that balance or adjusting that balance. Um, it's just, it takes constant monitoring. And, um, and it's really frustrating because you want to feel normal for you. Yeah, you want to feel like you. Right, mm -hmm. exactly, you know, and it's hard. And, you know, I think even as, you know, looking back as, as a child, mm -hmm. trying to, figure out what is what is you and what is normal how do you know you know it's like yeah. you know i'm left-handed and so i grew up in a in a left-handed world and mm -hmm. i didn't realize until i got oh second or third grade that my approach to handwriting and my approach to things was different than a lot of other people and were you ever told that that was wrong I luckily I was not told I, that That's it was good. wrong. That's yeah. good. Yeah, I was never told it was wrong. Um, thankfully, that was a few or maybe five or six years before me. But <laughs> you know, I do, I do know people that were changed um, because they were told it was satanic. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, left hand. <laughs> yeah, um, but. I was lucky. I was not trying to change, but like, you know, in baseball, I had to have a left-handed glove and, mm -hmm. you know, and then as time goes on, um, all of a sudden you find your perspective is different mm -hmm. and that it's okay that your perspective is different. And we're all different. And I, and I feel like, you know, we're all humans and, we all kind of de at the core want the same things, but we all, but in, we all grow differently. And 
being much more, I, I feel like, you know, we're, it's, you wouldn't know it by looking at social media, but I feel like we're at a point where we're a lot more accepting of people's differences in, you know, where, or at least compared to, compared to 50 years ago. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, I, I was watching, um, the weakest link just before we met uh -huh. and they had, they were doing twins and, I'm looking at the groups of twins that they had on. And for me, being a woman of a certain age, I was like, whoa. But what I saw, really, there was nothing wrong with it. It was just stuff that, you know, types of people that I'm not used to seeing. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to be politically correct here, so I'm not <laughs> no. calling out what um they were they were different they were different and um my mind still has a little bit of trouble wrapping itself around that mm -hmm. and um I, but i try to accept everybody for who they are you yeah. know if yeah if they're not, you know, if someone is not e evil or and I don't mean evil, but I mean like hurtful to people. There you go. Then what's wrong with them? I mean, mm -hmm. and I don't mean what's wrong with them. I mean, then you need to accept them and love them for who they are. Exactly. It's if their content of their character is, is good and good intended, you know, because there's there's jerks everywhere. And but if they're if they're not harming you. It's, I think that's fine. I, I mean, it's live your life, you know, go with, seek what brings you joy. I, um, I think though, sometimes we get, I, I, I feel like we need to cut the more senior generation some slack though, because like, if I all of a sudden showed up and I shave, if I, you know, I shave, if I shaved my beard, everybody's going to be like, whoa, you shaved your beard, you know? So if I come, if I just one day show up in a dress, there's got to be that, that, that room, wiggle room for, I mean, it's, you know, no one's going to throw, throw rocks at me. You know, that's different, but you, there's, you got to cut some people some slack to be like, you can't just be like, so anyways, Aaron, uh, what's going, you know, tell us about this uh, podcast you're doing. You know, there's got to be some, you know, some yeah. slack especially yeah. coming from a more senior generations where they were coming from. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the thing, you know, I, I've talked to Cole about stuff, you know, I don't get to talk to, to Chris quite as often, but I'll say something to Cole and she'll say, mom, you know, because it's so um, inappropriate in this day and age. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean it that way. It's mm -hmm. just that, that's the way I was brought up and I don't mean it to be inappropriate. You yeah. know, I recently, I've just been learning about transgender and, um, trying to wrap my head around being transgender and what does that mean? And, um, so I might misspeak about someone who's transgender or someone that, um, or, you know, anything, the, that whole sexual um, alphabet yeah. group. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and I'm trying really hard to understand it. And, um, and of course, to make matters more con confusing to me is, you know, I, I a Christian woman and um, people tell me that some of it is wrong and I'm of a mind where I'm not so sure where I see that it is, mm -hmm. you know, so because I'm trying to be, I believe that God um, wants us to accept everybody. Yeah. I'm, you know? I'm, I'm with you on that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on a lot of things actually, but I, I'm with you on that. It's, I think that, I think that there's, there's a lot, there's the more important stuff. I mean, we could talk religion, but, you know, I really feel like when you get down to who 
who people are inside, you know, the uh, going to Martin Luther King, the content of your character. But I also think that intentions are important. And I feel like it's, it's, it's almost unfair to demand so much from others and to be so knee jerk when someone's trying to understand, you know, because I think intention is very important. And I think sometimes we, people get, and, and there's and there's charlatans out there too that like to create controversy for attention but i think that if you if you're focusing on it like like in your case you're this is something you're trying to understand are you going to be, be able to say things perfectly no it, but that's that's that should be understandable it's like it's like if if i was trying to explain minecraft to you you know like you would like you would be like okay so is that mr minecraft i'm like no that's steve or, or something but i shouldn't go no that's steve how can you not know right exactly you know like that that to me is ridiculous and i think i think if you it and i think this with culture with race with with backgrounds with different countries with nations i think that the more inclusive we are ra and, and informative rather than I almost feel like some cases people want the controversy because they want the arms link. They want to they don't want to share these things with others. You know, they want you to be they want they want people to not understand them to it kind of puts them in this victim spot where if you truly want someone to understand you. You know, and, and, a, and a miscommunication happens. Take that time to just have that conversation, because you might. And and I feel like the more the more we discuss things, the the closer we we are to each other, and that with the more we find out, we're a lot more alike. I I don't know if you've heard of Daryl Davis. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with Daryl Davis? Daryl yeah. Davis was a jazz musician, and he would play for a lot of different bands. He used to travel with James Brown a lot. And uh, for for a whole for a long time, he would travel with other band members. They would drive; they they couldn't afford to fly. And he started finding that he would travel with some, you know, southern people of a southern persuasion, and uh, who were members of a certain secret society. No, but he would <laughs> like he would find that he would like there. It started. He was traveling with another band member who was a member of the clan. And Daryl Davis is a black man. And they're they gotta drive eight hours in the car together. So conversation comes up, and the, the other person starts talking about his beliefs and how he feels like you know the white race is, is superior. And Daryl starts asking, instead of getting all up some big argument and probably driving off the road, Daryl starts talking to him. And they have this great conversation. And then by the end, and after the end of the conversation, he changed, you know, he, he changed the dude's opinion about a lot of things. By the time they came back on the other drive, on the drive back, he quit the clan. Wow. Daryl Davis is now, his claim is over. He has collected over 200 clan, clan outfits. He has gotten over 200 people to quit the Ku Klux Klan. And he's done it by simply, simply discussing, having those conversations. And I think that's what's so much more important than anything, whether it's transgender, whether it's, you know, race, whether it's culture. I think that, I think we, where, and media, whatever, gets clicks, whatever. I feel like if we're, if we try, make more of an effort to communicate and have those discussions rather than kind of I this is what I believe and there's nothing you can do to change my mind it's having those curiosity and those discussions I think can I, I do so much more for healing yeah. rather than than driving things apart I don't know if would you agree absolutely um you know being open-minded wanting the knowledge and I guess in that particular case that you were just saying you know that I would think that the guy, the white supremacist, probably initially didn't want to have the knowledge, but, you know, just being with, would you say his name was Darius? Daryl Davis, yeah. Daryl Davis. Um, he got to know him on a personal level and yes. he realized that, that um, the guy knew his stuff. 
you know, and got to spend the time with him. And a lot of times that's all it takes. If you get to know somebody and you get to know that person well, and that person is, is an upstanding person, mm -hmm. then you begin to take what they have to say to heart and give that more credit than, you know, what you hear on the TV or what you read on social media. Um, and, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that anything you hear on, on, on social media, if you want to prove it, you can go out and find any, prove anything, yeah. you know, if you wanted to prove that the earth was made out of candy cane, you could go out there and find something that would yeah. say that, you know, it's, I mean, that's obviously extreme, but it's just, I feel like it's gotten that bad mm -hmm. and it, it makes it difficult for people to know what they truly believe because well, you don't, don't know what is a viable source anymore. Well, and you, you touched a huge point there. Be open-minded, be, be able to change. I mean, that's what we teach, you know, um, Cole will tell you this, or I'm sorry, Nikki will tell you this. She's cold to me, but yeah. um, she'll tell you too. When we teach our kids um, scientific inquiry, the whole thing is uh, if you have a hypothesis and your data shows that your hypothesis is wrong, you sh your conclusion should say, oh, my hypothesis is wrong. But that doesn't mean that you're wrong. And I think a lot of people get this, they get attached to an idea or a hypothesis and they have trouble separating themselves when new data comes through and they, they have a hard time realizing that, Oh, wait a second. You know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong about this and nobody wants to admit when they're wrong. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not saying it's easy to do, but it's really, I think it's tremendous to have that open mind. Right. And like you said, you know, um, the hypothesis might be wrong. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean you're wrong, per se. Mm -hmm. It just means that maybe there's a tweak that you need to rethink it. Yeah. You know? And so maybe you're not wrong. It's just different. Absolutely. And I think that a lot of times talking talking to people, you get to find, you, you, you personalize them a little bit. You know, they, you, you instead, it's so easy to put a group of people into a box and, you know, your father, my grandfather, had a great saying about the emptiest cans make the most noise. I've used that so many times because it's we we tend to late find the most ridiculous and absurd and negative version of any group, and we tend to kind of well, all of them are like that. Yeah, you know, like, um, and you're probably going to hear a lot about the Jets fans just got Aaron Rodgers. So, you know, all, all those crazy Jets fans. Well, most Jets fans are probably fine. There's probably one or two Jets fans that are jerks. But it's, yeah, it's, it's funny how, like, like sports teams tend to kind of, that, that, that tribalism tends to translate to a lot of things in the world. Well, I'm a Patriots fan, so you know that that tribalism translates <laughs> to a lot of things. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, um, you know, so, uh, you know, my father, your brother, you know, he was uh, he was a big Tom Brady fan until Tom Brady went to uh, Tampa Bay. Now he can't stand him. I'm kind of like, ah, okay, what changed? Oh, his team changed. Yeah. Uh, okay. I see yeah. what happened here. <laughs> yeah, I had a I I had a problem with it when he went too. It's like, <laughs> what? He let us down. Oh my god! <laughs> how could you? How could you do this? Huh? You're a patriot for crying out loud. <laughs> yeah. No. But I'm... it is interesting how, like, the parallels. To, now, now, sports, talking smack in sports, that's kind of, that kind of goes hand in hand. I mean, you know, that's... I know that dad wouldn't let Deb go up to the, uh, into the, into the TV room because it was only Patriots fans allowed. Chicago fans had to, had to stay in the, uh, in the living room. And, you know, <laughs> You know, those kind of things. Dad's still hurt, though. But see, Dad's still hurt from uh, the, when the Patriots lost the Super Bowl back in the 80s. Yeah, I remember, 
you know, that Chicago just destroyed them. And, and I felt so bad for dad that he was, he, he was crushed. So I'm, I'm sure there's some trauma, there's some trauma there. He's still dealing with, but you know, and then, then his son goes and marries a Chicago fan. Uh, what are you going to do? <laughs> but you know, you do see that kind of tribalism translate into politics into, into different cultures, different, you know, different other thoughts like, fandom i am a big uh, pro wrestling fan and there's two major companies now and you see that like the people that like the wwe there's a the empty cans from them fight with the empty cans from the people that like AEW. and what happens is like they'll they'll say all AEW fans are like this when it's really just these four morons yeah the same thing the other way and it's it's the, it's the morons that make it make, give a bad name to all of us you know what really has gotten me a little upset and and frightened a little bit i don't know if you've heard it in the news down where you are but um there have been some shootings up here mm -hmm. um i say up here i'm not even sure if it's up here where people have inadvertently gone to the wrong door or have pulled into the wrong driveway yeah and the people that are answering the door are just afraid because a stranger has shown up at their door and they're just afraid of the people that are there. You know, these people that are answering the door, um, and I've thought about this because, you know, I had mentioned to you about the mental health people or yeah. the people with mental health issues. These people, you know, they, they don't have mental health issues, but they're just afraid. Yes. You know, and so their answer is to shoot these people. And it just shows me the level of fear. You know, talk about mental health, mm -hmm. the level of fear in this country right now. And it saddens me because, and I don't know. Um, I don't know what's causing the mental health for people to be so afraid. Well, I, I think, I think social media exacerbates it. Is that the word? I, I always struggle with that word. Makes it worse. Yes. But I think that there's the, there is a, and I don't think it's like a sinister plot. Like there's not some Dr. Evil with his stroke in his cat somewhere. I don't know. Maybe there is, but um, I feel like it's more, that the more like because more sensationalism the news is, it's the more eyeballs it gets, the more clicks. You know, if the news was puppy dogs and ice cream, nobody would watch the news. But I think that we people have really become very scared. And what tends to happen, like we're talking about the shooting where the uh, the the transgender person shot the the six people in the school, and immediately, like the the two sides of, like of different issues jump in and try to make it about their issue instead of us stepping back one let's look at the situation let's get more information but also there could be a nuanced take yes we could look at maybe some gun reform but also we need to look at mental health and also we need to look at different things and i feel like a lot of times people want a simple explanation but there's a lot of complex discussions i mean you couldn't you can't get any more complex, but if you look at what happened when they, the Supreme Court pulled back the Roe versus Wade and you had just people screaming at each other and not taking the time to go, all right, I understand, like trying to listen to the other person's argument because it's not a bunch of dummies that can't, that, they're, they're arguing with each other. They're intelligent people. And there's an intelligent argument on all all sides of, of a lot of issues. And I feel like it's instead of taking the time to, I, this is what I believe, this is how I feel, but let me hear from you. Oh, and then people might start to go, oh, okay, that makes sense. Because there there is an argument to be made about a, a woman's body and a woman's right to choose. And then there is an argument to be made that there is a life growing. And there is there is that it's a gray area issue and to be so absolute 
about an issue like that without really having it, without without curling into your political shell. It's almost like a um, I'll use a, I'll use a New England term. It's like a cohog. You want to get into your <laughs> you want to get into your old shell and be like, ah, oh, this is what I believe. I'm gonna hold on to this pro. No, but you instead it's it's you you need to have that open discussion. And I almost feel like I almost feel like it's it, it it's things are pushed to divide us more rather than to have those discussions. Do you well, feel that way? Yeah, you know going back to the the transgender um shooter mm -hmm. you know you were saying about all those people coming in you know you have people from the transgender community and you have the people from the the school and all that i heard and i only heard it maybe twice um the police and fire department that responded to that shooting responded extremely fast mm -hmm. and did their job exceptionally well. And I heard that twice. Yeah. And then it was dropped. Like it didn't matter anymore. What a wonderful job they did. Even though it was a hard, you know, can you imagine having to have that job, walk into that school, make sure all the students are okay and still have to take that I mean, I'm sure they didn't want to have to take that soul out. Mm. No. And, you know? and, and especially after, like, I saw a video where they blurred it out, but you clearly see the guy that's going in. He passes by the body of one of the girls that died. Who was, she was reaching, the one that reaching for the fire alarm to try to, 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 to save her friends. And you see that moment, there's that moment of hesitation. Absolutely. He didn't want to do that. But again, Uvalde, on the other hand, we heard a lot about the missteps that, that, that they made. But then, yeah. You know, so <sighs> what's wrong? You know, we should be hearing more about what a good job they did and the mm -hmm. fact that the training has taken place and that training is taking place. Yes. And these men and women that were responding did a superb job and that's what we should be hearing you know not all the other stuff i think it goes back to the empty cans make the most noise though and it, it's sad you're absolutely right we should be hearing about that but what happens is we you, you in in just about any job a there's a small percentage of people that are terrible at it you know there's you know, for every ice cream scooper, there's that there's a 10% of them are terrible at scooping ice cream. Problem is when you get into education or you get into law enforcement, that bad 10% can really cause some damage. You know, a bad, a really bad teacher can really be traumatic on a kid. A really bad law enforcement uh, officer can be, can be terrible in that situation. Not to mention there are there's there's a lot of um, folks talking about systemic problems in police the police um, departments, but the solution is not what I've heard where they say defund the police. The solution is not to shame the police. The solution is to train. The solution and, and the more like the more I find out how little training police officers get, you know, and to have those support. Now same thing with teaching too. The there's there's so little support out there for these crucial jobs, and you and then you're surprised when and I can't imagine like it's kind of what the situation you're talking about. I can't imagine being in that situation. I'm about to take. I have to take this life, and I have to be perfect because if I make a mistake, it could cost me my job. But if I make the other mistake, it could cost me my life. And, yeah. and not and not no and having that hesitation, you know, it's I can't imagine how that would feel. No, and I'm just I'm blessed to not have had to have that situation. Well, you know, you're blessed not to have that situation, but as a school teacher, mm -hmm. you could have. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that's that in and of itself is scary, and I get, um. 
I have my moments when I let myself think about it, you know, with Nicole mm -hmm. in a school system, Abigail in a school system. Um, it's, it's frightening. It's very frightening. It, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier with the, the kids in the van. It's, and it, it seems like there's more of these kind of things happening and there's no simple solution to it. You know, we had a Newport news. We had a, a, a six-year-old um, shoot a teacher and this, and now there's a lot of systemic problems in education and a lot of it stems from how powerless the administration is now when it comes to dealing with students. You know, they're very afraid of litig being sued. There's litigious reasons for why why there's a lot of a lot of things going on, and there's a lot of ignorance. That you have small minds in certain power positions that just more they're more focused on you know, on getting getting a pat on the head and getting a bonus rather than actually being there for their teachers. But I think there's a lot of other things, but there's there seems to be, like in that situation where the six-year-old brought the gun to school, he's telling everybody he's going to shoot the teacher. It's like, my first thing is, why does this kid feel like that's okay? Like what's going on in this kid's life where he feels like that's a good thing to do? And then when the teachers brought this up, the inaction of the administration was also like inconscionable. It, it like it was just was like terrible. And you think about this kind of, these kind of this, these kind of situations. It's like these shouldn't be happening in a healthy society. Well, you know, we felt it personally because um, Abigail and her dad went to visit his parents. And they were talking about it, and um, Andrew and his parents were talking about it. And Andrew made mention that maybe they should not discuss it right then mm -hmm. because Abigail was there. Yeah. And um, she internalized it. You know, she's six, the same age as the kid was. Yeah. And they didn't. Of course, you don't know. Um, how much a kid takes in at that Our kids age. are so much more perceptive than people give them credit for. So the following Monday, she went back, she went to school and she, she had a headache and they called me to go pick her up because she had this headache and they, they weren't sure when she went, they sent her to school with this headache. They thought she was making it up. Mm -hmm. So they sent her to school, but she continued with this headache. So I went to pick her up and I brought her home and I, you know, I said, you know, if you're sick, you can't be playing around and stuff. You need to lie down and rest. So I was putting her in bed and kind of tucking her in and stuff. And out of, out of nowhere, she said something about the word gun. And I went, what? And then she said, Oh, I didn't, I didn't say anything. And I said, what did you say? And then she started saying words that rhymed with gun, <laughs> but she wouldn't say the word gun. Yeah. So I thought maybe I misheard her that because this was, um, the news was on my mind that that's what I read. You know, I kind of read yeah, that into dismissed it. Dismissed it like maybe you, heard, you thought you heard it or something. Right. Yeah. So um, when Cole got out of school that day, you know, she got out early because um, Abigail was sick. Um, she came home and, you know, we talked a little bit and then I left. And as I'm driving home, I've said, you know, I'm thinking to myself, I should probably say something about this, even though I don't know for sure what I'm, mm -hmm. what I heard or not, but all things considered me. So I called her and I told her what I thought Abigail said. And as it turns out, she did say that. Ah. Uh -huh. And she'd been processing that what had happened, but she didn't, because she's so young, she didn't know quite how 
to approach it and how to talk about it because her father had said, let's not talk about it. Yeah. And so she thought that she thought that they weren't supposed to talk about it. And so because I had mentioned it to Cole, Cole sat down and talked to Abigail about it and then ended up the three of them sat down and talked about what happened. That's and, good. But when you have those kinds of things happening, you've got all these six-year-olds that they're hearing this and they too are trying to process it and they mm -hmm. don't have the words yeah. Aaron, to process. And not all of them are going to have the parents or grandparents to have that conversation with them. Right. You know, and so it ends up making um, the world a very scary place. Be interesting to see in the next 10 to 20 years um, how education goes. I, you know, I, you know, with technology and, you know, I, I teach virtually now and I, I wonder if we're going to get to a point where we're more, where, where kids are going to be more, you know, homeschooled or virtually taught rather than going to a school where there's pros and cons to that. But it, it just, the it, it, it's not a healthy society when these kind of things happen, but the la the worst thing we can do is to try to try to blame one thing on a multifaceted issue. And I feel like that yeah. a lot of these things are symptoms of deeper things that are, that we're struggling with in, in society. And, you know, the COVID lockdowns were, were changed a lot. But I also think it exposed a lot of things that we kind of took for granted um, prior to this. And I think there's some there's some inherent um, challenges. Now, not to get the tinfoil hat, you know, I, I guess I am my father's son, but, you know, <laughs> the uh, the but there's some I feel like the, the, the way out of this is to have these conversations. And, yeah. you know, the way out of these things is to really, really, you know, dive into these issues and you know we're not always going to agree i think though that we gotta we gotta stop um sorry uh, hey is that is that button face <laughs> no that's not button face that's mia oh I mia have... hello mia they've they've been creating you know typical to a cat um mom gets on the phone or she's doing something i've got two now and they are um they were creating a ruckus, but now, <laughs> you know, me is up and trying to get my attention. We've got Momo and Carl, and they, they're both polar opposites in personality. Carl, uh, he's very skittish with new people. He'll hide, you, you know, he, he'll take you a couple trips to visit for him to come out and, and try to let you pet him. Momo, she'll come right up to your face. You go, hi, <laughs> I'm Momo. <laughs> what do you, you got any treats? I'm gonna go run over here and scratch your boots, or you know, she yeah, she 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 thinks she's a dog too. That's what's so funny. But you know, you know, it, there's something about pets that bring joy. Like there's something about having pets that, I mean, for one, they're not worried about any of this stuff. No, nope. you know, we're we're all us humans are sitting here fretting about this and that. Yeah, their concern is, am I going to get fed? You know, yeah, when, I, when are you going to feed me? Yeah, and oh, is that a is that a squirrel? What is that? Yep. <laughs> um, speaking of different different personalities, um, my cousins, I love them both to pieces, and I always felt like I was their kind of their de facto older brother. You know, when I would come to visit, we'd always we'd always you know. The, the marathon Mario Brothers sessions that Chris and I would play and and bonking with Pitto. And I always yep. thought it was funny. We'd, Cole, we'd play some game that Cole made up, and so I'd never understood the rules, but somehow she always won. Of course she did. <laughs> it was like like this. But um, very, two very different personalities. And, and um, 
you know, granted, grandma, grandma was able to help with a lot of the, da the daily stuff. But how was it raising two very different, distinct personalities? I mean, both awesome, awesome people and grew up to awesome, become awesome adults, but very different. <laughs> they were. And um, it's interesting because, you know, Chris was, I would have liked to have said, Chris was very easy. You know, and we went four years, three and a half years without a, another child with her. And I thought it was because I was su a superb parent. <laughs> I'm super mom. Well, yeah, I'm so good you know, at this. Yeah. This child is so good. You know, I could put her in a room and never worry about what she was doing. <laughs> and it was because I was a good mom. Mm -hmm. you know, I That's had, right. It's true. I had my act together. <laughs> yeah. And then, so I talked their father into or her father into having another child and then i had nicole <laughs> surprise yeah <laughs> and you know nicole bless her soul is um demanded attention and obviously their personalities are very different and mm -hmm. chris was willing to kind of take a step back and and nicole always wanted the attention and so it became, it did become difficult, um, but you can't, you try to adapt the best you can and, and do the right thing for each child. And sometimes I think I let Chris down because she was so willing to take a back seat. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, when, like in school, um, you know your children. And in third grade, I think it was, she had a teacher telling, I had a teacher for her that told me that um, she wasn't reading up to par, up to the grade level. And I knew that kid could read. Yeah. There was no way that this kid couldn't read. And I tried to get the teacher to have her tested and the teacher wouldn't do it. The teacher was just lazy. Hmm. So I took Christy and had her tested and found out that there was some learning disabilities. Um, and I brought the, the tests and everything back into the school and had them filed with her. And the next year she had a different teacher and the teacher said that there's absolutely nothing wrong with this child, mm -hmm. you know, and she worked with Chris and they got her on an IEP because the function, you know, everything went in. She just couldn't get it out. Yeah. And I, I don't know what they what they call that these days, but um, she. You know, she she was as smart as any of the other kids. But that other teacher, you know, you were saying earlier, you know, sometimes you get a good teacher and sometimes you don't. Yeah. And I, I think that teacher that didn't want to test her, you know, she was, no, I shouldn't say this because that's being judgmental, but I think she was older and she was done. She didn't want to have to. Well, that's true. I mean, anymore. you got to be honest and, and that, and that, that happens. And, you know, the sad thing is there is teacher burnout. And there's and one of the sad things about the teaching profession is so much gets dumped on the teachers when there should be support networks in place to, to help. Like there should be a reading specialist dealing specifically with, OK, hey, we're going to evaluate to take that off the teacher's plate. She a teacher, the, the general a regular teacher should be focused on their kids. There should be a specialist that would should pull Chris and go. All right, we're gonna we're gonna test your reading and see how you do. And there there's all kinds of politics well, and, and back stuff too. And that's what they ended up doing. You know, there was another yeah. program that they had in place back in those days. And this again, this was with Chris, you know, because she had this disability. They mm -hmm. had this thing called Right to Read, and basically, um, they just had them look at words and you know what Abigail calls sight words. Yes, the word. B and all that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. Well, Chris never got sight words. She didn't understand sight words because she was somewhat dyslexic. And 
um, I remember talking with her teacher about the sight words mm -hmm. and she was, they were, ha they were having an open house and the teacher was explaining about this right to read program and how it works so wonderfully for all these kids and blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I'm sitting in the back of the class and I'm just looking, I'm giving her, I must've been a death stare. <laughs> cause she looked at me cause she and I had had this discussion cause it didn't work for, and she goes, it works for the, you know, it works wonderful for the kids and blah, 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 blah. And then she looks at me and she's like, well, it works for most kids. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. You know, and Yikes. she didn't. She didn't mean it. She, re, I mean, this was a great teacher, but she understood that there were those kids that it wasn't going to work for. Well, and it's a fallacy to say it works if for for everybody because that and that I think is a common thing in education where they something works well with this group of students, so they prescribe to everybody. It's the old. You know, give every patient in the hospital an aspirin and expect them all to get better. You know, everybody's so different. I had, I, I, I tell the story a lot in the educators podcast. I had, the, I had this student that was dyslexic and he, um, but he was gifted. So up until third grade, he could outsmart the tests. He could, he, you know, he would, he would do well. He wasn't, you know, he was like a B minus student, but he was doing well because he could outsmart it, but he was dyslexic and things would, it wasn't until I caught it. Uh, it wasn't until I caught some of the things like I had him write the word. I said, write the word now. And he would write O W N. And then I would say, what word did you just write? Show me what word is this? And he'd say now. And it was O W N. And he would, you know, we, we started looking at that and his, his mom ended up getting him tested for, for dyslexia, but he used to go home and complain like every year at school in math and all the other courses, he was always at the top. Like he was with the the, the really wicked smart kids. You know, he was with with those kids. But in when it came to reading, he was always grouped. And this is his words. He said he was always grouped with the booger eaters. And that that <laughs> that's what he told his mom. Now that, she's telling me this. Of course, we're laughing about it. But what he meant, what he realized, what was frustrating to him is that he was like minded to all a lot of the other, you know highly you know the folks that are looking at math equations but when it came to reading because of his reading skills but once he got the help it was let sky was the limit for him what i remember from that meeting though the iep meeting that we had for him pr prior to the mom coming into the room one of the specialists made the comment she goes He's on grade level. Why are we meeting for this kid? Why do we? Why are we making an IEP for him if he's on grade level? And that just killed me. And I, I, I almost got heated because I said because he's dyslexic, and like we're not. And I think it's the it's the mentality in some in a lot of places in a lot of education where they're so worried about passing the standards that they're we're losing sight of what's best for the kids and i think there's it's changing now because there's now a focus on growth student growth where it's it, now we're focused on okay if you're here we how do we get you here and it's the same for really smart kids if you're here what's going to get you here but i feel like for so long it's and and it's because it's financially motivated you want to get that federal money you want to get that state money you got to pass those standards and you got to get accredited. And I think that's kind of where a lot of these things come from. And, and like you said, and, it, and it's, it's so crazy, the difference that a good teacher and scary how a bad teacher can affect a child. Yeah. Yeah. It's and like, who knows if, if, if Chris had a different teacher, how different things would have had. Yeah. And it's, it's something you can't really, you don't know what's going to happen. Or, you know, it, the same with the programs, you know, they come up mm -hmm. with these curriculum programs and they think that they'll work. And sometimes kids get lost in the cracks yeah. because of various things. And, you know, as, and the poor teachers, a lot of times, it's not through any fault of their own. They're told that they need to use this curriculum, mm -hmm. you know, and they may not want to use that curriculum because they know to, kids get lost in the cracks. And that's, that's where you start to see a lot of teachers burn out or teachers quit. And I, 
I think they're, the problem is a lot of these folks that are making these decisions are so far removed from the classroom. And I think there needs to be a lot more flexibility with teachers too. You know, I have a master's degree in education and yet I'm in a meeting with somebody that has only three years teaching experience telling me that the way I'm teaching is wrong. I need to teach a completely different way. The, yeah. you know, the way that I've taught for so long that has been effective. And, and I know it's been effective, not just because of the results, but kids are com- we're coming back to say hi to me. You know, you don't come back to Mr. Burden's room because you're afraid of him or you didn't like him as a teacher. You come back because, hey, Mr. Burden. You know, and, you, and you learn stuff from him. Yes. You know, if you didn't learn anything from him, you wouldn't bother with him. Exactly. He's a waste. You know, right. That kind exactly. of thing. But, I, and, but that's, I think that's what goes on is there's there's such a like a there's such a narrow hey almost almost a control thing like they the people that are making these decisions are so far removed from what works or they get a bonus for coming up with hey look at this new thing that I've got you know that kind of thing so yeah I think that happens in a lot of places yeah unfortunately I, yeah unfortunately too <laughs> Well, Auntie M, we've been over an hour. This has been fantastic. I've I've had a blast talking with you. We could do another hour if you want. Well, I think for tonight I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll revisit this another time, but this has been great. And uh, I really I'd, I'd appreciate to, your insights. I'd love to talk to you again, um, whenever. But uh, like I said, it's yeah I, again i'm a, a woman of a certain age <laughs> <laughs> well any final thoughts for our woman of a certain age on on today versus when you were growing up or any any final words of wisdom to uh to our listeners oh let me think i know <laughs> <laughs> I was com- I was trying to come up with something, you know, really superb, but you know, I, it's it. The world is just changing so fast, and you just try to keep up as best you can. And whenever your nephew calls you and asks to be on his podcast, you say yes. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Seriously, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate Auntie M. Um, this has been great, and um, I'd love to have you back on again. So, everybody, you heard it right here. You know, life changes fast. Do the best you can to keep up. And if I ask you to do my podcast, say yes. It'll be a good time. Say yes. Say yes. <laughs> all right, we'll see you all later. Thanks again for joining us for Mental Health Mondays. Bye. Catch new episodes of Mental Health Mondays every Monday morning at 7 a.m. Start your week off with a smile and some inspiration.